Okay. So we will cover NLP today. Just within a, one lecture, we plan to review NLP past, present. And if we have time, we get into future. But suppose we don't have sufficient time, uh, we defer the future to the last lecture. So once you have done some projects, the future may make much more sense. So nature language processing, first of all, I'd like to thank all my collaborators, HAI, NLP team, DeepQ, and Google AI. And uh, a lot of materials are actually coming from other organizations. Just collectively, I'd like to acknowledge their contributions. So we can divide uh, the research and engineering of NLP into about three stages. Past, between about 1950 to 2013. And the most of models are hand engineered. So what do you mean hand engineer? Uh, just one simple example. Suppose we want to uh, characterize similarity between two words, let's say lady and gentleman. And we have to put them into a similarity matrix. We assign the similarity scores between those two words. So this is a very labor intensive uh, process. And also, even we can characterize similarity if without considering context, a word can have multiple meanings. That's called polysemy. And we couldn't deal with polysemy very effectively in a word level. Then this uh, neural net era uh, came to a life. Between 2013 and 2018, and these people start to get into data-driven NLP. And in the first few years, we still follow this traditional, we need to label a document. Let's say this document belongs to computer science. Another paper belongs to maybe medicine. Then with sufficient number of training instances, we can train a classifier right, using subovector machines or neural nets. But the entire area, entire field takes off in about 2017 and 2018. When Google came out with this very ingenious idea called self-supervised learning. And uh, I will talk about this self-supervised learning and in the second half of this lecture. But basically, data-driven is the major uh, driving force behind this uh, second epoch of NLP. Then frontier research. So once nature language can be processed effectively and uh, the research community move into multilingual and supporting much better machine translation, and we want to support multi-model combining perception images with languages. And this is still an area in its in infancy. So there are a lot of opportunities to do very interesting research and even start a company in this multi-model multi uh, neural net or deep learning area. And there's another interesting direction is we do have a lot of nature language tasks, which I will enumerate in the last, next slide. How can we unify all the different tasks, this is called multi-task learning, onto one similar or, or the same infrastructure? Instead of everyone building its own vertical, can we unify all the nature language tasks onto one single foundation. So this is cartoon I got yesterday on Twitter. So it's very humorous. We look at bird, right? Uh, how many people, I think maybe you can just wave your hands. How many people can understand this cartoon? Right? How many people heard about bird? Okay, so in the end of lecture, you probably appreciate this, this uh, humor much better. So basically, uh, uh, on the right-hand side, we see this uh, pre-trained model of bird. And uh, you can ask question on this pre-trained model. You say, what's wrong with something? You ask a question. And then this uh, pre-trained model will look into the context, which is the right-hand side, maybe a paragraph, and eventually find out the answer to the question. Okay. So a, a little bit abstract right now, but Hopefully at the end of, course, at end of lecture, we, we get a point. So these are a list of typical NL, NLP tasks, including like information recommendations, uh, information can be news, can be search, and uh, document summarization, 
new summarization is one example. Document classification is extremely critical. Question answering, this is getting uh, more and more important because uh, different companies or different domains, they would like to minimize, uh, minimize labor cost. So if you call into, let's say a bank or investment agency, and you start to see, you start, start to see recording, right? Start to hear recording, ask you to say, if you want to do something, press one, press two. And those are extremely primitive. So suppose you can answer more complicated questions. So even follow-up questions like say, I want to reserve a hotel. And maybe after you finish the task, the QA system asks you to say whether you want to book a rental car or maybe you want to book your flights, right? So we have to, I mean, with NLP, we can do something even more. So the final task here is dialogue. And dialogue pretty much aiming to to other direction. So if, if you are in, really interested, you can just search on Amazon Alexa Price. So currently, it's on its uh, third challenge, and try to make chatbot social. So the passing criteria is the following: you talk to a robot, and uh, in ten minutes, you cannot tell whether that's a robot or human being. And currently, most of the chatbot you can tell it's it's a robot within maybe just uh, 10 or 20 seconds. Okay, so can we unify the infrastructure to support all these applications? That's the question. The objectives, the metrics to measure success, including definitely we want to improve accuracy. We like to minimize training time. It's important because let's say your training time takes three days to rank your, let's say news or articles, then the freshness is a problem of your application. And definitely reducing serving latency. Otherwise, a customer may wait for a few seconds to get results. That's typically not acceptable. And uh, improving engineering productivity. And can we do zero shot learning? Last time we mentioned about transfer learning. Can we do transfer learning also in the NLP domain? And uh, fine tuning and multi task training. So, language, right? Do you consider animals like chimpanzee, do they have languages? Maybe they, they do. Now you see chimpanzee cuddle babies and uh, they alter, alter some sounds. But the difference between human beings and the uh, other species is we actually recorded our thinking, our knowledge into books. So over the years, using language, knowledge accumulated. In the past many years, maybe a thousand years, we use uh, writing, but in the maybe last 10 or 20 years, we started to do recording, recording onto the tapes and videos. So novel ideas become innovation, past innovation becomes today's knowledge. And we don't have to reinvent the wheels, right? When we are born, already relativity is already devised by Newton and or Einstein, then we just read the books, pick up the knowledge, and we develop innovation based on the past knowledge. And no other species can do such. Right? All the species, they may have born with some instincts, but the knowledge couldn't be accumulated. So they have to start from scratch once after they, they were born. So what's the difference between, let's say, the closest to human being, chimpanzee? The difference is only in DNA two and three. The chimpanzee, DNA two and three, the chromosomes combine together into the second chromosome of human. The physiologically, chimpanzee and human has 95% similarity. But in the genome, if you look at the structure, only the second and third one of chimpanzee becomes the second one of human. But the difference, whether it's causality, because the genome changes and human can have knowledge accumulated or not, we don't know. But which is a, what is the cause and what is the <laughs> A result or effect, and we have no idea. So why human came up with language? So this is the example I went to Kyoto, Tokyo, two, three years ago, and I went there almost every year. So I look at this picture, when I came home, I need to convey to my family what did I see, right? So if you consider 3,000 years ago, we did not have cameras, or even painting was not very popular. So when a person went to see something and they want to come home to convey to friends and family, 
this person has to alter the experience using language. So this is the reason language came out. People want to share experience. So I told my family, I say, well, uh, four in Kyoto, that was my uh, experience. Then start to ask me what exactly is the, you are amazed about the four in Kyoto. Then I told them some details. And in perception, maybe they thought about those other pictures. Not really the same pictures as I, I had in my, in my mind, but they are good enough, right? Language can convey ideas. But now we, I have an interesting question. I say, okay, the vision research versus nature language processing. We know in 1958, and uh, Hubel and the Wiesel, later they won Nobel Prize because of their model of cat's cortex into a biophysical model. So you look at picture A and B, so from retina structure, and they came up with the biophysical model to mimic the cat's cortex. About 25 years later, and a few uh, scientists, including Yang Lukang, and came up with the convolutional neural net, right? Initial neural net was simpler, and Yang Lukang had put into this convolutional layer in the beginning to do uh, low-level feature extractions. And that's really wonderful. But if you look at the NLP domain, NLP domain actually did not get involved in neural net until around 20, 2010 or 2013. The question to you is why? This is an interesting thinking question. Why perception or images? We already done neural networks, uh, let's say between 1985 to, to today, but NLP just started about five years ago. So maybe I had, can give you some of my thoughts, right? If you look at images, you say this was picture we saw before, it was a paper written by Andrew In and uh, his student. So not only we use neural net to interpret images, but we can visualize the neurons, what they are. So low level neurons will be basic features of a particular image. And middle layers, we see parts of the target semantics. And like cars, we can see wheels, doors, as their middle, neuron, uh, middle layer neurons. So visualization can be performed. And on animal study, and you can actually, the Berkeley has done this extensive, extensively, and you can just wire a person's brain and allow them to see some uh, photos, and then you can see different neurons get fired up. So the, the more advanced research, just based on what neuron get fired up, and without seeing the image, the researcher can predict what kind of image the, the person has seen. But you look at the perception model in the beginning, biophysical model. The research was done on a cat. And uh, you cannot do the same research 50 years ago on a person. You cannot cut up a person's eyes or brain to try to analyze the structure. And since animals do not have language, only human has language. So you couldn't do language experiments on, on animals. That's my first conjecture. So therefore, only until after image processing competitive vision became extremely successful, then the NLP uh, domain saying, okay, okay, let's just follow, right? That's a, a reasonable conjecture. And uh, okay, let's look at past, then and also the, the, the current uh, epoch. The current epoch started from 2013. The first uh, milestone you mentioned was word to vac and then we came to sequence to sequence, which is basically recur uh, recurrent neural net, attention model, transformer, bird, and so on and so forth. We come back to this picture uh, slightly later on. So we, let's focus on before 2013, what was going on. And that will give us an intuition why this data-driven approach was superior and what the NLP uh, research has improved in the last uh, about five, Five to, five to six years. So from linguistics, words basically started with, uh, they are discrete symbols. And for in Tokyo, you have three tokens, right? And uh, 
in different languages, let's say Japanese, you have four characters to represent the same meaning for in Tokyo. And we have more than 100 plus languages in the world. And so the first difference here compared language with image is the following. For images, there's no language difference. Whether you speak in Japanese, speak in English, images are images. The parts you learn, even in English or whatever languages, the parts you learn about a car, all the same, universal similar. But for languages, it's interesting if you look at for in Tokyo, in English, we have these three tokens, right? For in Tokyo. But in Japanese, there are four tokens totally different from English, but they are representing exactly the same semantics. If you look at computer representation of Tokyo and the Dongjing, which is in Japanese, they are definitely not similar at all. They are totally different in encoding. So how can we characterize similarity in uh, the workspace? That's very challenging. So 50 years ago, people started just using this one hot vector to characterize a word, do a representation in computer. But the problem number one is there are just too many words. In English, we have about 250K basic words. And then you have uh, many, many more depending on the domain, like scientific domain, medicine. And also a word can have multiple combination, like uh, they say tomorrow is okay, but like verb, move. You have moving, moved, right? And so you have, if you use one hot vector, the vector size, the metric size will be really, really large. Let's use a toy example to explain. Not only the metric size can be huge. So this one, we only have nine words, man, woman, boy, girl, and so on and so forth. And uh, you look at this matrix here. Uh, we have this nine by nine matrix. When a word is present, they say man, only one bit get turned on. So this is called, that's the reason they call one hot. So the size of the matrix can be very huge. And another problem is between men and women, although they can be similar in certain semantics, but you have no way to characterize similarity because if you compare those two vectors and uh, in any fashion, they are not similar. Boys and girls and boys and men, right? They, they pretty much, if you do cosine distance, they give you zero. So we definitely need to fix that problem. Similarity have, have to be addressed. And also polysemy, right? Uh, like bank and fall. We can get into more details uh, later in the lecture. In fact, let's look at fall, fall in Tokyo. So I talk about fall in Kyoto, fall in Tokyo. What do you think about it when you look at this phrase. Right. This phrase can have different meanings. There are four different pictures. The left one, the left one, one is that it's a Tokyo market crash, crashes. And after the typhoon, the, the trees fall, fall on the Tokyo street. And you have Tokyo really the waterfall and the, the season of Tokyo. So this is called polysemy. We have to be able to deal with that. And traditionally before this, uh, data-driven era, and researchers using human heuristic and the uh, linguistic principle to do pre-processing. So I wouldn't get into details, but you can uh, view lectures of this NLP course, maybe the first or second one, tokenization, normalization, stemming, annotation, similarity. So all done by human, human crafted all these, uh, perform all these steps. And similarity, we say, well, one half vector, we really cannot deal with similarity between words. Then folks saying, well, that doesn't matter because we are most interested in the, the context level similarity. Context means objects, uh, a sentence, to the similarity between two sentences or similarity between two documents. In fact, in most situations, we are interested in similarity between document, let's say document classification and uh, document recommendation is all in the unit of a document rather than just a sim single word. So it was not really a disaster if we only we consider higher level semantics. And this is the way people characterize a document uh, before 2013. So a document is a bag of words. 
Suppose on the left-hand side, we have all the words in the dictionary. And then in the, in the column, I'm sorry, every column is one document. If a, a word present in the document, right, we, we, we actually register their frequencies. Like document four, you have against happen once, ago happens twice. And after this matrix has been built, then we can compare document similarity using like cosine distance function. Suppose D4, let's say, and D7, we compare those two. They both have against and age be present. And then we say, well, they may be more similar than we compare with document four and document three. So we, we, could, call, we could call this uh, similarity in a context level or cost grant level. It's not in a, in a word level but it's sufficient for many NLP tasks. So in this word representation uh, quadrants, and we use the left-hand side on the, on the assets, and from no context consider, and uh, to the right-hand side with context, and in the white assets, and uh, we only consider word, word presence at the bottom, then we consider them, we consider word count, then eventually predictive, uh, methods, right? So the past NLP research is falling on the uh, bottom left quadrant. We when we look at the world, we don't consider its context. We only consider in the document level uh, is it's a context, but not in a word level. And we only consider word presence in the co-occurrence matrix. Okay, so we will start to see the progress in the last 10 years on this particular uh, picture. So shortcoming of merely co-occurrence. First of all, there's no semantic relationship between words, which were already kind of very obvious. You look at one half vectors uh, characteristics. And synonyms, many ways to refer to the same object and cannot be performed. And uh, this leads to poor recall. Now if, so if, for example, if we search on, for search cars on Google, if cars, Google do, doesn't know cars and automobile, they are similar, then they cannot do query expansion properly. So the recall will suffer. And polysemy, right, this example of fall you know about, and also two or three other very, very uh, popular examples like bank chip model. And this will lead to uh, poor pre precision if we, if we cannot distinguish those words. Give you a very uh, popular example utilized by many companies, including Amazon, Google, and Facebook for many years. And this is called market basket problem. So market basket in the beginning the intuition was when we go to, go to a market to shop, and if in my basket, if I bought diaper or I bought carrot, what else I would buy? The supermarket will use this kind of information to do shelving or promotion. So if you visited Costco uh, several times, you found out sometimes they will move things around. And the, the way they move things around is, suppose you buy milk, at the same time you probably will buy diaper. They purpose, purposely shelf diaper and the milk to totally different areas uh, in, their, in, in their shopping place. So therefore you have to walk many aisles eventually to find your desired merchandise. But when you walk around, uh, like in my case, I would probably just pick up other things, which I was not intended to buy in the beginning. So they can sell more, more goods. And for information recommendation, this is a very rudiment, rud rudimental example. Suppose I have already seen three pictures and even the computer doesn't know the semantics of the pictures I've seen. The computer can start to do a recommendation based on co-occurrence, right? So co-occurrence, they saw, okay, you, you like the first three pictures. And uh, you, then the computer say, if other people visit the first three pictures, also visit the, the fourth one, then when you visit the first three pictures, I'm going to recommend you the fourth one. It doesn't matter what the semantics in the photos. So the mathematical model was association rules. A, B, and C implies D, and you can rank D uh, based on their probability. And the Bayesian interpretation is 
given A, B, C, what is the probability of presence of D? And very simple, we can use in just count. Like in the market basket, you count the presence of A, B, C together, and then you have this, uh, the presence of A, B, C, D together. So you have this formulation, conditional variable, conditional probability to try to predict what will be the D with the highest probability. So how do we solve that problem, market basket problem? In fact, it's very simple. So for this example of information recommendation, we have two dimensions. On the left-hand side, we have users. Every single row characterizes a an user. And, uh, and the columns representing information uh, instances. Maybe can be images, can be news, can be advertisements. And uh, you, the, you look at every single cell, when one is present means a particular user uh, click on the image or click on information piece. And after we have collected this concurrence tag table, then we can say, well, let's do a prediction, right? So for this first user in the matrix, should we recommend the first picture or maybe this particular brown one with question mark? So to solve the problem, we look at uh, co-occurrence. We say, well, okay, first users saw item number three, four, and five. Who else also saw three, four, and five? Then maybe second user has more similarity than the others. So the first question mark, we say, okay, the second user didn't really click on this particular first image. So we are not, rec we are not going to recommend it. It will be a zero. And the, the sixth one, the second user clicked on the image. So we will recommend that one to the first user. Okay, this is pretty uh, intuitive, pretty straightforward. Again, the market basket or association rules uh, as a model can solve this problem. But this model suffers from uh, two or three shortcomings. The first one is quite obvious. You look at the numbers in the cells. The number is either zero or unknown or one. But if I'm very interested in a particular article, I'm, I may st stay more time on the article rather than a quick bounce, right? Or I, can vis I may visit the article multiple times. So you have to be able to characterize not only just the presence, but also the strength of the interest. So it should be a, a real value in there. And the second problem, you look at matrix quite sparse. So sparse matrix means insufficient information. The first idea to tackle the problem is doing dimension reduction, right? We talk about small data issue and the first solution in the last 20, 30 years, people work on dimension reduction like uh, uh, SVD, uh, singular vector decomposition, or just getting the highest eigenvalues and preserving a much smaller semantic matrix, and which we will discuss in the next two slides. And the third problem is, suppose I have a new user come in. I'm a new user comes to this particular application. I don't have my behavior record recorded in your application. So you don't know about my behavior. How can you compare me with other users? So nothing can be done. And the Facebook is okay. For Facebook, they can use other means, like say, who are your friends, right? From there, they can do collaborative filtering. But for search, it's pretty much just uh, you just from this co-star problem, you cannot do anything about it. So summarizing this, uh, these are the shortcoming strengths of the interest, matrix, sparsity, uh, semantics. We so far only deal with words, but how about semantics, right? And then co-star. To address the problem, uh, the most popular solution between about 19, uh, sorry, about 2005 and 2013, it's a latent semantic analysis. The idea is, first of all, we put strength into the matrix. So instead of just unknown and one, you see the, the matrix on the left-hand side, three, two, depending on duration people involved in viewing the images or, or articles. And then on the search, right? So when people doing search, it's, it, you, on the right hand side, we have this one sim very simple example. Suppose I do search, there are two terms, iPhone crack and apple pie. Then we have two documents, 
One is it's a recipe for doing apple pie. And the other one is how to install uh, apps on uh, Apple mobile phones. And suppose we look into semantic space. iPhone crack belong more to the IT. So IT probability is higher and higher probability in IT, lower probability in semantic food. And Apple Pie has higher probability in, in food, in this food semantics. Similarly, we also characterize those uh, documents based on their semantics. So we have food for this particular recipe and IT for this, how to install application on Apple mobile phone. So when we do query, in addition to just matching keywords, in fact, if you look at this uh, Apple Pie, and the, the recipe itself doesn't have this word, it actually, actually has a word Apple, but if you look at on the right hand side, this phone, it doesn't have iPhone in there, right? You only say iPhone crack. So first of all, some pre-processing need to be performed. iPhone is a product of Apple, and the iPhone is talking about IT, and this Apple is about IT, not really food. So the matching can be more precise, uh, performing the semantic domain. So that's the whole purpose of finding latent semantic and then using semantics to improving uh, precision. And uh, semantics, again, is not, not really new. We talked about it already. So if you look at neurons, new, new, uh, neural networks, the semantics is pretty much in the middle layers. And the bottom layers could be, you can consider syntactic or fundamental features. And LDA performs the following. So first of all, LDA collected this co-occurrence matrix in the middle. And we use uh, news articles, and every news article has multiple words, and their, their co-occurrence matrix. Then we factorize this uh, news word matrix into two sub-matrices. On the right-hand side, we have words and the topics. At the bottom, we have topics and news. For the bottom matrix, the the purpose or the usefulness of the bottom matrix, then we can do classification easily, right? You have news article belong to different topics. On the right hand side, this is the first time people can characterize words and in a more fine grained level. So no, no longer a word is just a one half vector. The word can be a topic and by its association with other words. What do I mean about that? So we look at some more concrete example about this uh, topic word uh, vector. So after processing 37K documents with the uh, 26K words, and suppose we set number of topics, the K to 1700. So we get 1700 clusters. And these are six examples, six example clusters. And we look into more details on these clusters. So the first cluster we see character, right? On the second one, we also see characters. But you look at the co-occurring word in this particular cluster, you say characters and play. So the second uh, cluster, this character is a character we think of play, we think a movie, something like that. And the, the first one, the character is associated with printing. So it's character on a piece of paper in, in the document. And then we move to the third cluster, we have play, and the court. But this play associated with core instead of associated with, with characters, its semantics will be different. You're playing basketball uh, in the basketball court, right? Then core, we move to the next cluster. This is the court evidence, means pretty much you are in a trial, trial court rather than a, a sports court. And uh, we move evidence to the next one, test evidence. This is scientific evidence to uh, prove a particular hypothesis, whether it's true or false. And then finally test. Uh, we study, we, we conduct midterm exams and final exams. So with contextual information, then every single word, the polysemy of the word will be addressed. So this is really wonderful. And then maybe you consider at the time to say, wow, these the traditional methods are effective enough. In fact, what's the effective enough? So that's the reason Google was pretty successful. So we look at this uh, progress with LDA, we could move to a better place. So we still don't have sufficient context. 
if you look at a particular word, we say, okay, yeah, we consider some context already. So we move to the right a little bit. And we also consider word count, right? Rather than just word presence. But we still have some issues. If you look at this uh, example, we have three documents. Each one has this play, right? And uh, in linguistic uh, terminology, play is a word, but the same word play has three different tokens, means three different semantics. The first one, first article, you see the play with token ID 82, the second one with token ID 77, the third one with token ID 166. The question here is, can I have two tokens within the same document, two tokens of the same word in the same document, right? The answer under LDA is probably no, right? So let's say if I have a sentence, right? So the polysemy characterized by LDA, we are considered to be cross grain only at the document level. But at the word level or sentence level, it may not work. So this is one example here, I visited a bank along the bank of river or bank of uh, uh, Mississippi River, okay? So I have two banks in the same sentence, but LDA will only give me one token instead of two tokens. And please chip in to buy a pizza and chips for our group lunch. So you have chip and chip, two chips, two different tokens, but the LDA will only give you one token ID. So we have to address the issue. Fundamentally, the problem was already seen many, many years ago by linguistics. And you, we, we just look at the first uh, objectives uh, spelled out by John Firth. You should know a word by the company it keeps. So basically, without contextual information, we may not be able to characterize the meaning of a particular word. So we know about this already, but can we do fine grain uh, context information? So we have cross grain in the document level. How about in the sentence level, or we just look at the word and its neighbors, they get two or three words, a small window. We can still characterize the meaning semantics of the word precisely. So this is the, the, the current era, about four or five years ago, and uh, started with word to vet. So word to vet was incidental. And this is a result, let's, let's present the result first, and then we go into the, the process, how did they come up with this uh, embedding. On the left-hand side, clearly it's a one half vector. Uh, we have these five words, and uh, one half vector, every word has one element get turned on. And after doing this uh, word to vet, every word is mapped to a vector in a high dimensional space. And then they do this uh, dimension reduction to have this uh, two dimensional plot. And on the two dimensional plot, we can see run and jump, they are nearest neighbors. And dog, rabbit, cat, they are also in the neighborhood. And tree and flower, they are together and apart from other words. And this is really great, right? Because now, if you look at the invading space, we can compare word uh, similarity effectively. Still, we have, still have a shortcoming here. Although this is a big improvement uh, from this uh, one half vector in the word level, but we cannot deal with polysemy because every single word only has one embedding. It doesn't have multiple embedding. So suppose we put a chip in this space, we only put chip as one dot and chip can be closer to food, but then it cannot be very close to the computer chips or chip in. So how, how can we deal with that problem? That will be much later. But at least I think we get into this uh, word embedding semantic space. Right. And uh, let's look at how this word embedding was accomplished. This was done by Google engineers in 2013. You see, so look at the citation of paper, definitely they are very influential. And every NLP test right now start with word to back. You get a much better representation, then start other processes. So how this word to back 
was derived. We look at two possibilities. One is uh, continuous back words. Suppose we have five words and we take out the middle word here on the left-hand side and we try to do this called self-supervising learning. We have five words, take out the middle one, and we build a, only one layer neural net, try to guess the middle word correctly. So we just train this very simple neural net. So after the accuracy become very high, then we take out this uh, middle projection layer, just one layer of neural net, and that will be our embedding matrix. It seems to be crazily simple. And on the right hand side is the other way to, to uh, derive this word to vec. Instead of guessing the missing words, we want to produce the contextual words. So five words, given the middle word as an input, we would like to guess the surrounding four words. Right? Again, we have the ground truth. Every document, you can start to move the window. You take out either the middle word or you just uh, use the middle word as the input and using the surrounding words as the ground truth output. So no one has to do annotation. So all the training data, the pain of creating training data was alleviated. This is in really ingenious, right? Some people consider this is probably unsupervised learning, but still supervised, supervised by the document itself. And uh, the left-hand side model is called CBOW, and right-hand side model is called SkipGram. Uh, the performance of both are very similar uh, based on the researchers their intensive experimental results. So this is a concrete example. The cat, something on the roof, right? So the missing word is set. And then we just go through the process to just uh, be able to guess the word set. And this middle matrix eventually would be uh, the word to vec mapping matrix. Of course, you have multiple questions here. You say, well, it may not be set, right? can be light on the floor, can be jumping on the floor, can be many other things. So how to deal with that problem? And that's probably will be the future of a neural net. So more clearly, uh, the data structure on the left-hand side, still one half vector, cat on. Right-hand side the output, still one half vector, only one big get turned on, set. And the middle layer just try to learn the mapping between the input and output. If the output result is not satisfactory, then doing backward propagation to fix the, the, the weights of the hidden layer. And eventually after sufficient information get pumped in, the word to value is done. So there may be one more question. What's the dimension of this hidden layer, right? So you have this uh, word to value embedding and this, this embedding space, how many dimensions should be sufficient? 12 dimensions, 512, or 1024, or even higher dimensions? Uh, this is really interesting, and there's no theoretical study a foundation based on that. But empirically, right now people are using 512 plus 124 divided by two. This is the so-called uh, the de facto number or the state of, of the R number, but we don't know why. We just, uh, empirically, we, we consider that's sufficient. The larger the dimension, we consider curse of dimensionality can be a problem. The lower the value, uh, the, the power is, may not be sufficient because you, you cannot separate the words apart. For some reason, this 700 something uh, seems to work pretty well. So there are details I just put on the slides and you can review or to get the reading some of the papers. The key is uh, this matrix, W matrix, is a lookup matrix eventually produced. So now if you have input of one half vector, you basically just multiply with this uh, uh, embedding matrix, you can get your embedding vector, right? So suppose cat number two, uh, then second bit is on, you multiply with this uh, embedding matrix, you get this embedding vector for cat. So the cost is very, very cheap, right? Okay, okay. Um, I said it, these two models are actually empirically 
uh, results, they are very similar. Uh, maybe there are some minor differences, but in general, they are the same. What can be done with using this uh, word embedding? First of all, we can, we can do analogy. The interesting example published by the authors, this is a king minus man plus woman, you get queen. You can perform linear algebra in the word space. And another example is uh, you see that all the capitals are on the right hand side, the nations are on the left hand side, and then we can do uh, this uh, uh, Thai, uh, Beijing to China, and then we give, give uh, the user or the computer Russia, and you should be able to uh, kind of return Moscow. And uh, it's also very useful. And uh, one challenge here is uh, there are too many words, right? We mentioned about not just uh, 250K English words, but also there are many derived words. And subword consideration uh, mitigate the problem. So there are two ways to deal with subwords. As we mentioned, they say move or any verb has multiple forms. So why not just have subword like a verb plus ing, a verb plus ed, right? And that will be able to uh, address this issue because when you have out of vocabulary, then your document characterization will suffer. And the second method is more brutal, just using character, single character. We only have 26 alphabets in English, right? But we run into curse of dimensionality, that may not be ideal. But just, just a side note, and uh, Jeffrey Hinton did a research a study about two years ago at the NIPS, NIPS, NIPS keynote. This is probably 2018. And he used his experience to talk about this machine translation. So machine translation, we will be assuming, let's say input will be English, output will be, let's say French. The input will be word by word of a document or a sentence. The output is in different language. And when you do training, then you say, well, yes, I would just probably input one word at a time. But Hinton said, if you input one character at a time rather than one word at a time, let's say we remove the space between words the result is actually getting better. The accuracy is higher. So this is stunning in two respects. One is maybe neural nets will be able to learn words. You don't have to provide spaces, right? The second stunning thing is, oh, so even the input cannot be read by human because you don't have space in the middle, but machine can figure it out. So what exactly NLP has accomplished why NLP is very successful using neural net is unknown. Unlike we are looking at images, you can see middle, middle layer neurons and they could be parts of a target semantics. For NLP, if you look at middle layer neurons, you just see some random bits, right? So it's, it, on, using another way to uh, try to characterize this issue was, let's say my input is in in English, uh, for in Tokyo, and your input is in uh, Japanese. They are totally different languages, different representations. So of course you will look at neural net, there's no, nothing similar between those two languages. But for some reason, uh, neural net seem to be able to understand both to be similar uh, in the human brain. So why? Nobody knows. And Hinton was very interesting. He was saying, well, Let's look, let's look at my, my brand. You look at my brand, let's say you look at professor's brand right now. Can you tell what's going on within my brand? The answer is no. I don't know what, even I'm altering words. You don't see the representations. There's no way you use uh, uh, the, the ways people uh, wire the brand to see signals when watching pictures. The NLP people just couldn't do it. So some tricks uh, dealing with the uh, out of vocabulary I just mentioned. So we, uh, like I'm working at DQ. This is the company I'm working at. The DQ is out of vocabulary and working like word has too many other combinations. So sub word is one way to do it. And the character base is the other way to do it. So great, we look at this uh, picture and we are moving to predictive representation, 
right? Word to vec is a predictive we moving uh, middle words or surrounding word out of the training data, and we actually getting a similarity uh, characterization in a much better fashion. Here we sort of consider context before, uh, not not really uh, like the the sentence context, entire sentence or fine grain context. We do see surrounding words or the missing words, so some sort of context. So let's look at this uh, synonym and uh, polysemy two challenges. With word to vet, great. We sort of dealing with synonym pretty well, so we, we celebrate, we are really happy. But polysemy is still uh, not entirely dealt with, right? Reason is very simple. If you have a word, you go to this table of W on the right hand side, upper right hand side, you only get one embedding value. You have this sing single word bank. You look up in the table, it doesn't matter where the, the word bank occurs. You, you only get one representation. There's no multiple representation for one single word. So 2013, we're still suffering from this polysemy issue. So 2016, Professor Aurora at Princeton and come up with this intuition. So a lot of, a lot of words and so here's the basic the red one saying here it is shown that multiple word senses reside in linear superposition within a word embedding and uh, can be recovered by simple sparse coding. It, it, it considered to be quite abstract, but let's look at one example he used. So suppose a particular word has multiple meanings. And uh, if you can find the embedding, so let's say you have four different words. So you have, we have four different vectors. In every embedding, we have a number of features. So we, when we compare, a new word comes in. So this is the, the trend vectors we have already obtained. A word has four different meanings. And then when we have an unknown, uh, word coming in. So we can compare with these four vectors to see which vector this unknown semantic one is similar to. Suppose the, the, the vector of bank is similar to the second representation. Then here we can say, oh, okay, the second one is the river bank. And then we, we, know, we can understand this particular, the word's meaning. So this was an intuition behind uh, Dr. Professor Aurora's, Aurora's method. And he came up with this, uh, sparse coding method to address the problem, but it's not it's extremely scalable. So then we come to the real revolution. This is around 2017. And uh, before 2017, we generate a vector just based on word, right? Word to vet, we get a representation. But after 2017, people saying, well, we talk about context for many, many years already since about 1954, let's put context into our function. I don't know why it takes so long for people to do so, uh, but okay, the context put in, then we generate a vector. And the first piece of work was done in 2014, sequence to sequence. And this is a, a really a landmarking work. And because if you don't do anything, people couldn't find shortcomings to improve upon. So 2014 sequence to sequence then, LSTM was done in the following year. And eventually at the end of uh, 2017, the attention model came out. So let's look into sequence to sequence first. So we talk about data driven, right? And versus traditional uh, model based. Traditional model use a lot of pre-processing and we have to handcraft similarity matches and maybe doing dimension reduction in the, in the LDA algorithm. But the neural approach, we basically just threw a lot of data into the neural nets and the neural nets would tell us the results. Okay. So you can say the computer scientists nowadays kind of polarized. So some computer scientists, if you cannot invent something new, you have no novel ideas, you become a data scientist. So this is pretty much in, I encounter in different companies. Uh, but then if you are very strong in algorithmic development, you can fine tune the models. 
you can easily get half a million dollar salary. So you get either 100K or half a million. So depending on whether your skill set is above uh, this uh, uh, threshold or below. Below is just processing data. So sequence to sequence developed in 14, these two major papers, you can look at them. And this is an example at a high level. This is a black box, uh, black box representation. We have a sequence as input. Suppose we are doing translation, right? We had translation, we input three words into the model, then output maybe three or four words, French to English or English to French. They may not be one-to-one -one correspondence, three to four. So this is high level. And now we open the box to see what's inside. What's inside the sequence to sequence model as one encoder and a decoder. So the encoder takes the input. So encoder takes the three input. At the end, it generates context and put the context of input to the decoder. Then decoder outputs four words. Okay. So the key here is the context generated by sequence to sequence. And this is, is more detailed. So we have an example of input to be in, in French. And first, the first step is to embed those uh, one half vectors into uh, embedded vectors on the right hand side. So once we have processed the input, then again, we input to this model, sequence to sequence, three words, one, two, see, we hidden, hidden state one, hidden state two, the third word we get hidden state three, but only the third one, the third hidden state get passed to the decoder not the hidden hidden state one nor two, right? So this is a key thing to remember. The hidden state one and two are missing from input into the decoder. So this is a problem of our RNN. So look at more details, then we can see in this picture, we look at all the input, we produce this uh, final token, which is context. And we only input context, the final context, into the output. And more clearly, we look at these two formulas, H, the hidden unit in the output layer is depending on its previous hidden layer and then the input only based on C. There's no C2 and C1, just based on the final C. And the prediction here, YT, again, the right-hand side, the input is only C here. We don't see, uh, S1, S2, or rather the fine grain C1, C2. So information shortage, right? Or when the word is in long distance, then we can no longer understand or getting the information uh, from the distant words. And this, you can consider this is called a kind of vanish, vanishing gradient problem. Only the final hidden layer are considered. So to solve the problem logically, we say, okay, we want to store the hidden layer information after every single word. So naturally this model, long-term short-term memory was utilized. LSTM was invented many years ago, but here they put it into RNN to try to uh, store this uh, kind of short-term memory. And then when we do this uh, prediction for output, we not only consider the last context, we consider every context, right? And uh, then we can have long memory and therefore the result can be better. But there are two major shortcomings of RNN plus LSTM. So we did solve the problem of long distance dependency. But the huge problem of RNN is we cannot do parallel training. And the whole, uh, Deep learning became very successful, not only because of uh, big data, but also because of scalability of training, right? We use multi-party with GPUs. But suppose hidden layer T depends on hidden layer T minus one, then we cannot parallel training all the hidden layers at the same time. It becomes a lost step training process. The sequential computation will just kill us. And uh, between 2014, to 2017, nothing was done, but at the end of 2017, two revolutions came out. 
First one is a transformer utilizing attention. Attention was also not new, was discussed by Chris Manning, uh, linguistic professor, uh, computer science professor teaching NLP at Stanford. And his team came up with attention, utilized attention in NLP in 2015. And the Google used, utilized attention mechanism and devised a new algorithm called transformer. And also at the same time, they uh, articulate this new uh, language model called bi bi bidirectional mask language model. So I'm going to talk, cover these two in the remaining of this, of this lecture. So this is uh, what happening in the last two years or so. But this is interesting blog by a researcher. This is posted in April, 2018. The basic meaning of this article was kind of uh, sarcastic. Basically saying, well, now a lot of companies uh, pay much attention to this transformer model using attention. So in other words, and I actually encourage students and, and researchers, I say, well, if you don't know anything about NLP before April 13th, 2018, you are missing nothing, right? Suppose you, you, you discard all the knowledge about NLP before 2013, by 2018, you are not missing anything. Uh, but of course, by going over all the past uh, research and ideas, we appreciate uh, these uh, new inventions by Google Transformer and later Reformer. It's great, I mean, we, have, we get better intuition, but practically speaking, all the past technologies, uh, they are not very useful right now after the attention was developed. So what is this model is all about? We have two components here in the transformer model. We have an encoder on the left-hand side and right-hand side we have this uh, decoder. And uh, both decoder and encoder is, are composed of multiple layers of attention modules, right? So you can have this, uh, I think Google now have maybe 16 attention modules on the left-hand side or maybe maybe some, some uh, GPT had maybe 64 layers, but it doesn't matter. The key idea is very straightforward. We, we look at every single attention module and it has the following characteristics. Both encoder decoder is a stack of attention modules. Every attention module has three inputs and then eventually they get the output. The inputs considering value, a value vector, a key vector, then we have a query. Then we query V, V, O, K, what do I mean? So let's say we have a value vector with three values, 150, 175, and 45. And there are three keys, weight, height, and age. My query is query on, on weight. So when you multiply Q with K, the weight is turned on, weight is one, the other will be zero. Then I can multiply K with V, I get output 150. So that's it about attention. The key is what in the value vectors you would like to pay attention on, right? So if your query is good, then you can get the accurate values from the vector. And the vector can be in a very huge dimension. What does that mean? It means if your vector is very, very narrow, like three elements, means your attention window is very small, only surrounding words, maybe up to three. But if your vector size is, is large, they say 512, uh, this is uh, the 512 is the birth, birth model. So you can look at pretty much uh, half of a document, but still not big enough. But every single paper, scientific paper, maybe longer than 512, maybe 2000. So, but for paragraph, at the paragraph level, no problem, right? And uh, again, we look at this long range dependency RNN problem, but attention model is much better to tackle the problem because we could, when we do a query here, we could look into all the elements in the vector by using this kind of key matching, right? Okay, that's really good. And okay, again, zoom into one uh, attention module. Uh, let's look at the details of the module. Basically again, V, K and Q, three input into the module. And uh, V and K were trained, come back to this picture, and V, v and Q were trained by the 
encoder. So V and Q will be inputted from the encoder and Q will be inputted from this uh, decoder. So decoder will come up with the, so if you consider machine translation, currently here will be, the first input will be a star blank, right? The based on the information provided by the decoder, and you can index into the vector to come up with the first word. And after the first word is, is came out, and you look back to the bottom to generate the, based on the previous word, right? Query for the next word. This is a traditional uh, language model predicting the next word. Then your input is different. Then we back, look, look back to the, this uh, attention vector V and K, and we query for the second word. The second word will be outputted. Then we're using the first and second word, and the plus is the third word as a missing word, and input to the decoder, and uh, we get the third word, and so on and so forth. The second, okay, this is another, another example, right, using VQ. Uh, the first example I already mentioned, the second example, I enjoy Tokyo Voyage, subject, verb, noun, noun. So if my query is subject, I get an I. So this is again an animation of how this uh, transformer is working. And transformer, okay, process on the left-hand side, process this uh, one input at a time. And then you continue to decode the second word and third and so on, so on and so forth. And eventually you can see on the right-hand side with the input, Right, input in, output in, in the beginning will be blank, and generate I, then generate M, generate A, and eventually generate student. So this picture is worth you to revisit, so you can see uh, when is the end of encoder training and the, when is the beginning of decoder. And it's important because, like GPT model, eventually you only use the decoder, and uh, this uh, BER model also consider encoder in their training structure, in the pre-trained structure. And computation complexity, this is just your, for, your, for your reference, uh, this transformer, because he can actually look into the past, his computation complexity may not be cheaper, but the key thing is we can do parallel computation. So overall, the training speed is much faster. The training time is much reduced. It's great, now we move to move our semantics or word representation to this with context and also predict here, right? So pretty much I consider this is pretty much the end of NLP research. If you can think about something even better to consider context to characterize similarity, and that'll be the next revolution. Okay, the next one is uh, about 10 minutes quickly. Uh, BER and GPT, they are super, self supervised pre trained models. And they are very famous. BER is done by Google, GPT is done by OpenAI Foundation. The only difference is their language model. And GPT considered traditional tra machine uh, uh, language model. Basically, traditional means left to the right. Traditional model means if I, if I see two words, the language model need to predict the third word. And for the bird, they have this kind of, kind of bi-directional mask language model. So guessing the missing words. So when they do the training, okay, uh, so this is, yeah. When do the training, the and traditional language model predict the next word. And for the bird, it predicts the masked words. So if I have a document, just like word to vet, I take out, randomly take out 15% of words. And I know the ground truth, I know the missing words. So I'm pre-training my encoder to figure out the missing words. And then after I trained it, it's kind of context-based, right? And the, the query, based on the query, and I would be able to evaluate uh, which con context is more important and to come up with the, the final uh, embed. So this is more detail. Uh, it's basically self-supervised learning and the NISA language model. And for BERT, uses mask language model, predict mass words 
and the prediction task was to say whether the 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 sentence one sentence is the next sentence of the previous one. So you have to go give machine learning some sort of objective and target and to optimize. So the training process is to try to mask uh, to get some missing words. And at the end, the other subtask is to predict whether one sentence is the, the next sentence of the other. So combining these two uh, uh, matches together, they were able to achieve reasonable results. So this is a more concrete example to compare GPT with uh, a bird. GPT guessing the next word, the man went to one word at a time. And uh, bird guessing missing words in the middle, the man went to supermarket, take out the supermarket to see whether the, the pre model can guess the word correctly, and he bought a gallon of milk, right? And in this case, the second sentence is the next sentence of the previous one, so the label is true for this pair. For the second example, the label is next, is actually false. So one question is, suppose we take out the second task, we don't do this is next prediction, and what would that um, make the, the performance, what would that affect the performance? The answer is not really affect too much. So you actually can take out the second optimization objective, just doing guessing the missing word, the mask word. And the reason, that, because if you write a paper, scientific paper, if you read some scientific paper, and you, sometimes you say, if I order two, word, two sentences differently, or I shuffle some sentence around, you, you can still read the article, right? So even let's say I look at the second example, the man went to supermarket and Mary walked dog every day. Well, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't seem to me this is impossible in a novel people write this way. It did, when we look at the article, these are not consecutive sentences. It doesn't mean they are not reasonable to be together. So although with exact prediction, the bird per performs about one or 2% better, but to me it's not extremely convincing, okay? It's just my opinion. Uh, okay, once we have this pre-trained model, how do we lay our tasks on top? So on the left-hand side, we train the BERT, which is a pre-trained model. Then we say, okay, we have some supervised task. Here we want to classify our document, whether it's a spam document or not spam. So we want to layer our application on top. In the next lecture, and uh, we have uh, our uh, project details presented. And uh, Jim Dunn, he, he has worked at Google for more than 10 years. He will present how to do fine tuning on top of BERT, okay? So fine tuning, uh, here I just give you a couple examples. Uh, in the beginning, we say, well, there are many NLP tasks need to be performed. So with BERT, we can put all the tasks on top of BERT. Basically, we input our original uh, words, right? Your document need to be classified. You still input those words. And the words will be embedded, word to vet. We have this new representation. And going through the BERT uh, pre model, we get a context representation of the words. And then we, you put your new classifier, your novel classifier for your test on top of BERT and doing fine tuning. This example is you input a sentence and ask BERT to actually eventually spill out a class label. And uh, for every vertical, we need to build a top layer. And there are two questions here. One is, suppose we build a top layer here, and uh, we want to do backward propagation, right? We are doing classification. Should we backprog into BERT to modify the parameters within BERT? Uh, we don't know. And there are some conjectures. And these are other examples. I just, you can read the slides. Mapping, mapping uh, your application on top of this pre trained model. And why using pre trained model? So this picture probably can convince you if you don't use pre-trained model of BERT by building every vertical by yourself, on this the traditional NLP benchmark, you can see using a pre-trained model, the accuracy can be improved for specific tasks as, as, as high as 10%. Even on certain tasks, the improvement is very small, like two or 3%, but this entailment, COLA, 
improvement is huge, right? 30%. So th there's no reason not to use the BERT as a foundation. And uh, <clears throat> so for GPT in the last two years, uh, GPT released larger and larger model. And at the one time, GPT considered not to re release it a large because they considered it to be dangerous. And they eventually they, they actually also launched it. Okay. So this was the progress I conveyed today to, to the course. So we uh, started with no contest, only word presence. To now we can have this very fine grain characterization of word with contextual information. And multitask design, if you have multiple tasks, these are some uh, experience shared by other researchers. So if you have sentiment analysis, probably you, you don't want to start with BERT. Uh, sentiment analysis was not very successful use, using BERT as prediction model, but other tests are very good. But how, do, how, how about bad propagate? If your training task, right, if your data for a particular uh, task, let's say news summarization, if the data is very scarce and don't bad propagate, that could create noise for other applications because every application share all the applications share the same BERT pre-trained model. And the prefer to modify weight uh, metrics only when the training data is abundant. Those are the kind of experience shared by researchers. And look at the future after BERT. It's just a, a crazy situation. After 2018, there are so many derived models and many, we can, we can say enhancement, but all the improvements are actually marginal. And we can say from birth, there are multiple births. And we try to characterize those uh, multiple births. They can be divided into multilingual births. Suppose you have one birth for English. Can we just, uh, without any work, can we input French? And then you can do the, the same task. Suppose you have a task doing English news classification. You train in English total. But now we, I just want to input German or, or French. Can the performance be satisfactory? The answer is actually for some language, the accuracy is quite good. Like French uh, on top of English bird, accuracy can be as high as 80 some percent. But if you, if you input Japanese into the module, accuracy become 40 some percent. Why? It's interesting to understand. This is probably, you can think about it. I'm not going to give you the assignment to do so, but you can think about why. Um, it's not really uh, the tokens itself. It's, it's other reasons. And multi-model BERT is, is a current trend because we want to consider not only just perception independent of language, we like to combine both together to do something even more interesting. And unified task layer, this is done by Salesforce. And basically all the tasks I talk about can be layer, layer something even on top. Uh, the Salesforce put a layer, just Q&A, on top of BERT. So if you say you want to do translation from English to French, you input English, then your question is, what is the, what is the French translation of the word, of the, of the sentence, right? This sounds very stupid. Your question is, hey, can you translate this particular sentence to a different language? And for classification, you say, what is the class of this document? You just ask questions, and this Q&A module on top of BERT will be able to do a lot of different tasks. And the publication of this uh, uh, DKL NLP, they, in, in the last year or so, I think the accuracy definitely cannot compare, com be comparable or competing with the single domain kind of vertical implementation, fine tuning of implementation. But this direction is interesting. If you can do well using just QA model, then you can save a lot of grief for the engineering deployment. At the same time, yes, a lot of people will lose their jobs. There are details here with the, uh, this is roadmap of different various bird uh, derivatives. If you're interested, you can look at here, there's, there are comparisons of different models and uh, the pointers to literatures. Okay, so the final summary is uh, like to, maybe you take home to think about it. Does bird really understand language or bird just simply after reading so many documents based on big data, data driven, bird is like just a pattern recognizer, right? When we talk about the Go game in the first lecture, and AlphaGo in, in the beginning, the training process is very heuristic, very intelligent, very heuristic. But once you have, you have a trainer model, the, it becomes a database lookup. 
right? So can you say the bird is the same? Eventually, after you train, you just have a lot of patterns. You see a novel pattern, you go to this huge dictionary to do mapping. Uh, it seems like there are researchers saying, well, okay, bird is a hack, and bird is not that intelligent. So you have time, you can look at those articles. And finally, I conclude with this picture. It's just interesting. Once you have <laughs> understand the bird a little bit, so this is posted just by Julia Gong yesterday. So this is like a type of joke, right? You have <clears throat> input, what's wrong with bird? And uh, with some documents, the output will be, oh, he is in quarantine and uh, suffering from lack of attention. So with such, I think we uh, finished uh, today's lecture. And uh, in, the, in the end of the quarter, and after we have some experience with NLP and, and maybe perception images, multi-model learning and small data learning, we will come back to revisit uh, the history of NLP and to project some future research topics. Okay, any questions? Uh, otherwise, we uh, conclude the lecture today. Thank you.